Hey, Pat McCardell here, back with another episode of Shop Talk. Today, all about how you go from a brand new belt to getting beautiful longevity out of your used one. So I'm holding in my hand here one that's got a few thousand miles, still good to go, and I wanna tell you guys, how do you take one that looks like this, use it for a long time so that it still has plenty of life in it looking like this. All right, so the first thing you gotta know about a new belt is how do you actually break this thing in? So I got the clutch cover pulled this off this uh, Pro XP so you guys can see everything going on. So we got the primary clutch here, we got the secondary here, and the belt that connects the two. So the first thing we gotta understand about a brand new belt is that you actually need to match the angle of this belt to the angle of the sheaves on the clutch. So when you think about that, when you got a brand new belt, you know, it's kinda got, well, you can see one right here. Right, it's got an angle on each side. And that angle isn't always perfect to what the clutch is. So in the first about 50 miles of riding, what you're trying to do is actually match this belt perfectly to those clutches. So in order to do that, if you're riding easy trails or things that don't have a lot of load, high gear's okay, but it's gonna take you about 50 miles, you're gonna wanna vary the throttle and don't go wide open. So kind of think quarter throttle to three quarter throttle um, and keep your speeds in that you know, 20 to 50 range um, as you go. If you're running in the dunes and you end up having to replace a belt, then low gear is your best friend and stay in the little baby dunes. It's gonna take you about five to 10 miles and be sure you run an all wheel drive when you're in those heavy loaded conditions like dunes. Um, because if not, you can actually damage your belt right away. So the biggest thing that happens when you got a brand new belt is that you actually create a bit extra heat because that belt is working to match those clutch sheaves. And you wanna be able to get those perfectly matched before you put full power through this system to make sure that you got a belt that can go from this the one I showed you here that's got almost 3,000 miles on it and still in good condition to keep running. So a couple other things about belt braking that we hear guys talking about. You know, some people think, hey, I gotta take a bunch of dish soap and water and wash this thing off. Well, there's really no mold release on these newer belts, so you don't have to worry about that. You can take a dry belt right out of the box, put it into your machine. The other thing when you're starting out, you know, don't be towing another unit, don't be trying to find super heavy road loads, you know, don't be trying to use your vehicle for like massive work, especially if you got maybe a ranger or a sportsman until you get that belt fully broken in. So what are some of the things that we hear about people doing that actually destroy belts real fast? Well, the first one is not using low gear when you need it. So when you think you bought a brand new razor, I'm going to load this thing on my trailer, Best thing you can do, shift that sucker into low, put it in all wheel drive, and actually get into the throttle enough to get the wheels rolling. So where we see a lot of people go wrong is they treat it like their, their truck that's got a torque converter. They ease into the throttle thinking they're actually taking it easy on their machine, but you're actually tending to hourglass or spin burn this belt. I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Um, the next thing to think about is when you're sitting on a hill going up, don't use the throttle to hold it there, right? You wanna use the brake to hold it, and don't like keep your engine revved to just into clutch engagement. So say, you know, 17, 18, 1900 RPM, where your wheels aren't moving, but your engine's revved up off idle. That's a terrible plan, because it's gonna basically be hourglassing the belt right where the primary is trying to grab it as that engine's spooling up and that clutch is starting to pinch. Um, the other thing, when you're in real technical terrain, again, be in all wheel drive, make sure you keep it in low gear when you're going up and over obstacles. And when you're running in dunes, all wheel drive is actually your best friend. So think about two wheel drive like a boat when some guy hits the throttle and it's starting to auger in and it's just pushing that bow wave. And then all wheel drive like a boat's coming up on plane. It's just a lot less load and it's gonna be easier on your belt to run that way. So anytime you see us running out in the dunes, we're almost always in all wheel drive for that very reason because we know we wanna keep belts in and not have to you know, pull over to help our buddies change them all the time. So what are some things you can do to actually extend the belt life You know, that aren't just bad areas that you're thinking of? So we talked a little bit about it, but how you engage this belt properly is you actually get into the throttle hard enough to get the wheels of the vehicle moving. So don't just ease into your throttle thinking like, oh, it's like my car, I'm just gonna baby it along. No, you actually wanna push that throttle hard enough to get the whole vehicle to engage the belt and start moving. So that way you don't hourglass the belt. Um, the other things when you think are throttle control in different environments. So, you know, if, if you're in sand, if you're in mud, again, if those wheels are stuck, you gotta get into the throttle enough to get them spinning versus just having them stay still. And if you're going slow speeds, shift into low um, because you're gonna get better gear ratio advantage through the transmission versus putting it all through the belt. Um, another thing when you're sitting on a hill, if you're pointed uphill and you're worried about that vehicle rolling back, again, you don't really wanna hold the brake and, and get into the throttle kind of at the same time, but you wanna hold the brake with your left foot enough that you can get into the throttle as you're releasing the brake so that your machine takes off going up instead of rocking backwards first, because that's gonna put more load into the belt as you get going in that condition. 
Um, I think another you know, good tip for people is if you got a brand, you know, a trip coming up and you wanna have a spare belt handy, don't just take one out of the box. Actually take your belt, put it on your machine, go through that 50 mile break in. That way you got a belt that's perfectly matched to the clutch sheave so it's ready to go when you need it um, if you ever gotta swap it out. And another tip to think about is you see how you can see Polaris and the part number across the top of the belt here? You always wanna install it so you can read that from the outside of the machine. That way when you take your used belt off and go to put it back on, you don't accidentally spin it around. So if you just remember, read it from the top down from the outside, you always get the belt back in the same way it came off. So great practice there for anybody thinking about belt swaps. All right, so the other thing you gotta know, after you've been running hard, you know, say, you know, going for long poles or maybe you've been climbing Oldsmobile Hill out in Glamis for a while, you know, you end up getting a lot of heat in your belt. So one of the best things you can do is actually shift that sucker to low gear and go run for a mile or two at a moderate pace because in low, your clutches spin faster, so you're gonna get more airflow through, it's gonna pull the heat from the belt into the clutches, from the clutches into the air, and exhaust it out. Um, another thing I like doing and telling people too, especially if you're running real high load environments like the dunes, is actually when you're done riding, throw that thing in park, actually while you're working on taking your gear off, just lightly rest your foot on the throttle, rev it up to about three to 4,000 RPM. It doesn't need to be super fast, but enough to engage and get that belt spinning. Uh, and do that for about a half a minute. So think of it as the amount of time it takes you to like pull off your helmet and goggles, take your gloves off, undo your seat belt or harness and step out of your machine. And then just let the engine idle until the cooling fan kicks off and then you know everything's kind of at the lowest temp it can be because there's always a bit of heat soak that occurs after you park while you know, all the heat that's in the bottom of the motor kind of works its way up. So that's another easy thing you can do to extend your belt longevity versus just jamming it in park, turning off the key and letting that belt get hot where it contacts the clutches. All right, so I got an old poster on the wall here that some of our dealerships may still have back in their service bays that actually shows a lot of the issues that people can have with belts, you know, from doing things maybe the wrong way or just not understanding how a clutch and CVT work. But I want to start with this hourglassing. So you can see there's kind of a narrow spot that's about, I don't know, four to six inches long. And that's right where this belt would wrap around the primary. And that's where you'll see that damage. And the things that will happen uh, that you'll notice if you ever do this condition that we mentioned earlier where you're revving the engine without the wheel spinning is that your machine will kind of stutter or jerk on takeoff. So when you get into the throttle, it'll, it'll feel like you're going go, 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 go. And that's because your clutches are trying to react to that narrow spot in the belt. So easy fix, swap a belt, break a new one in, that'll take care of that. Glazing, the next one here, we do also see um, if people get contamination. So, you know, if you end up getting any oil or, you know, you got a belt that's just way beyond its service life, um, it'll start to get real shiny and it'll start to get real skinny from that belt slipping across the whole length of the belt. Um, easy one there is figure out why you got oil in that area. Make sure you fix that first, then swap your belt uh, and move on with your day. Um, broken belts and disintegration are probably the other ones that aren't, you know, maybe as common, but we end up seeing. And really like this disintegration or a broken belt, a lot of times that those are, this broken belt is often gonna be from like a shock load. So maybe you're going from a, a looser terrain to one that's got way more traction and that drive line takes a big impact load. Um, this isn't as common with our newer belt technologies, um, but disintegration, you'll see people that run into this when their belts just let go. And a lot of times you'll get this when you don't have a proper break in and your belt's running too hot um, and you keep pushing it hard and maybe you don't follow some of those best practices I talked about. So now we're gonna jump back and I'm gonna show you how to swap out a belt and how easy that is. All right, so real quick, what are the tools you need to actually get at your clutch and belt and what do you need to be able to swap it out? So your razor should come with a tool kit that looks about like this. And inside, there's three handy tools that you're gonna want. The first one looks like this. It's basically an eight millimeter nut driver on one end with a square drive on the other. The second is this bent handle that's a square drive. So you can get you know, low torque, high speed this way or you know, higher torque, lower speed this way. And then this little jobber that's a 90 degree bent threaded tool that this is actually what's used for spreading out your driven clutch. So the way these work, pretty simple. You slide these two tools together, that gives you a nut driver. That perfectly fits the bolts on your clutch cover here. And it also fits the hose clamps uh, that go on this big duct that I already removed um, that you can see right here. So pretty simple operation there, but you can use that for you know, removing this duct. So once you get all the bolts loose on your clutch cover, nice thing here on this Pro, they don't come out. So you just pop your clutch cover out of the way. <coughs> then that's where this tool really comes in handy. So <coughs> as you go, you'll see one spot that's threaded on your driven clutch here. And what you do, this takes a minute or two, uh, and I'm clearly not left-handed, so this might be a little awkward. Um, 
But you just start threading this in and eventually it'll start getting a little more tension to it. And as we keep twisting this thing in, what you'll start to see is that this belt is gonna start dropping down in this secondary clutch. And as we go, the goal here is basically to loosen this clutch up enough that we can get enough clearance to slip that belt right out. Now, a lot of people will drive this thing until it completely stops. <laughs> you wanna just be careful that you don't, you know, twist it down and kind of over torque the tool. You just generally need to get it loose. It doesn't always have to be like fully bottomed out to be able to slip a belt on and off. So, <laughs> you know, as you go, usually you get it enough. And then if you start down at the bottom here, you kind of grab the belt in the middle, start sliding, and you should be able to slip it right around the driven as you rotate that around. Then pinch your belt, shove it off the primary, and pop it right out. So pretty simple operation. <laughs> and then reinstallation is the exact opposite. So, you know, pinch your belt to slide it over the primary. <laughs> Make sure you get it all the way around the top and the bottom. And start at the bottom. Make sure you kind of <clears throat> keep it from folding over itself. And then once you got it in, you remove your tool. And you'll notice that as the tool's coming out and loosening, that the clutch kind of stays spread out. And this is one other thing to pay, pay attention to here. is that once you get that tool fully removed, you wanna take your driven clutch and just spin it a few times. And that'll actually help it clamp back in and get that belt riding back where it belongs. All right, so another pro tip, if you ever got a machine that's getting really hard to shift when the engine's running, but it's pretty easy to shift when the engine's off, uh, when you're down in here looking at your clutches, grab your smartphone, put it in camera mode, right? Basically so you can see a live camera view. And then when the engine off, what you want to do is slide that in between the clutches so that you can see where that belt's riding between the two sheaves. And you'll see here that I can see daylight on both sides of the belt. That's telling me that I've got a properly aligned belt on this machine. If it was biased toward either side of the clutch, basically what you got to do is pull this bolt off the secondary and there's a couple shims below here and you either got to add or remove the shim to be able to offset that driven to line that belt back up perfectly. So pretty simple thing to do. You know, any phone in your pocket's gonna be able to help you out there. Um, <clears throat> but that's a good thing to know. Um, as far as carrying a spare belt goes, you know, there's a few spots in the vehicle you can do it. A lot of guys will shove it like behind the seat. On these pros, it's kind of nice. There's a storage cubby right on the passenger floor that holds the belt really well. Um, one of the things you wanna avoid when you're carrying a belt, um, you'll see a lot of old like snowmobilers will take them and like twist them up like this so they're all jammed up. That's not actually a very good idea because it can cause them to crack when you shove it in a spot over time. So generally you want to try and keep your belt, you know, as round as you can or maybe, you know, down in a, in a location like this. Um, so yeah, overall, you know, make sure you follow your owner's manual when you go through this stuff, but it's not hard to do. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy if you kind of follow some of these tics and tips and tricks to be able to get a belt, you know, that starts like this and ends up like this, where you still got plenty of life left in it even after a few thousand miles of use. We talked about hourglassing. Here's what's not to do. We got this clutch cover off so you guys can see it, but we're gonna go start this engine, hold the brake pedal, shift this thing to high and rev it up so you can see what happens when your wheels aren't moving and your engine's trying to grab that belt with the primary as it revs up. If you look in this zone right here, you can see where the belt's been damaged. And this is really from revving the engine without the wheels spinning. And you see the rest of the belt as you go around is in great shape. There's really no damage at all. So it's only in this narrow region and you'll see it on both sides of the belt. You've got that same damage content that occurs. If somebody really held the foot into the throttle and didn't realize this was occurring, you'd actually see the belt would be even narrower through that section from a lot of damage content being applied. So remember, don't do that. Make sure when you get into the throttle that the wheels are able to spool up and spin. So low gear, all wheel drive, you know, a lot of those things getting into the throttle to keep that, that rig moving. All right, so we took you through some tips and tricks on how to extend your belt life, some things not to do, some of the damage that can occur. You know, when you're going to swap a belt, be sure to check your owner's manual because some different models have a little different, you know, procedures involved, uh, different tools that you need, but usually they come with the, uh, the tool kit with your rig. 
Um, so, you know, be sure you uh, like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of Shop Talk.